Hello. Welcome, everybody. Um, welcome back to our health and wellness series. I'm here with my uh, dear friends, Tim Fries and Chris Doty, um, two um, fellow advisors at Raymond James. We three of us share very similar practices and also just life philosophies and just the, the desire to want to help our clients um, live better lives outside of just money. And so that's really the heart behind why we do, we've do we been doing these series ever since COVID began. And then we have uh, Michelle here with us today, our guest speaker, who many of you know, who's a nutritionist and also become a close friend. She's going to share really today. I think the, t the, the, the topic is um, ways to continue on your New Year's re resolutions. Many people have moved past or forgotten or just fallen off the wagon. It happens. She's here to help answer your questions, go over some um, slides and different stats. And also she's going to talk today a little bit about um, diabetes prevention and management. And again, we'll do some Q&A at the end, but I'll let uh, Chris or Tim pop on and say a few words as well. Thank you, David. No, we appreciate that. And Michelle, congratulations as well. We have a new addition to the family, which is outstanding. <laughs> Outstanding, and thank you for really looking after our health. We appreciate that. I know our clients do as well. Have had great comments for that. And you know, one thing we understand: if you come to us for finances and retirement or whatever other you know you do on the finance side, but we understand that the finances are simply a resource to support what's most important to you. Health being one of them. And this is why we bring uh, Michelle to you. She's a fabulous resource. We really appreciate her, and I uh, love having her on here. So we want to bring programs like this that really can add value to how well you live life as well. So Tim, how about yourself? Anything from uh, from yourself? Yeah. Hey, congratulations, Michelle. Very excited for you. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, no, I, I guess it's another time to reflect. I know we're, this is sort of keeping the New Year's resolution um, alive uh, on the eve or sort of at the very beginning of Lent. I was thinking about yesterday was Ash Wednesday. And uh, so to sh I know you're not supposed to tell what you're giving up or whatever. So um, I've decided to really pay attention to reducing my sugar intake and the right and yeah. paying attention to it and keeping it under 25 grams a day. Is that right? That's yeah, the number? that's right. We're going to readdress that a little bit today with diabetes. Mm -hmm. So the unintended consequence of that is absolutely no cookies. Um, so oh. I did a little research and on Tuesday I bought about five boxes of Girl Scout cookies. So, um, so that's perfect. So I've got the little, you know, temptation out there. Um, and I did a little research this morning. So apparently Thin Mints, a, uh, 10 grams of sugar in the Thin Mints, Tagalong's a little bit better at, uh, eight grams okay. of sugar. So they're pretty much out. Um, good news though, I found out that Fritos, you know, the little corn chips, zero sugar so so i've Perfect. got that going for me okay you're doing great you're doing great tim <laughs> all the fritos you want eat up <laughs> i thought it was 25 i thought it was 25 grams of sugar an hour i didn't realize it was a day so <laughs> oh, no. i love to eat my notes yeah. all right right so michelle take it away straighten us out can't wait to hear what you have to say yeah, all right thank us. you guys Okay, thank you guys so much for joining us today. I'm going to share my screen with you. Uh, like the gentleman said, we're going to talk a little bit about those New, Year, New Year's resolutions, which uh, most of us have long forgotten. And then we're going to talk about diabetes prevention and management, a little bit of a two for one today. Some of the information you'll hear today will overlap. So those things that help your New Year's resolutions, if they were health and wellness focused, also will help prevent diabetes. So you will get a little bit of reiteration, especially when it comes to sugar today. But like we have done in the past, I want to start with a little bit of a pop quiz. So the first thing I'll share is that 48% of New Year's resolutions are centered around weight loss. Um, that was just a, a statistic right off the Google. If I had to guess, I would actually think it was more. But I want you guys to guess how many individuals make their resolutions, carry them through the first week of January. How many people are still working on their New Year's resolutions come January 8th. And I believe Ashley's gonna do a little poll for you. So you should get something that pops up on your screen. I think that's how it works, Ashley. So I'll give you a second to do that. But what how, what percent of individuals who make their, make their resolutions last through January 8th? Did we get that? Are you guys answering the poll? It Ashley? is, it's live. Okay. 
I can end the poll here. So we have 40%, 17 people, or 17% of our group chose. We have 25%, which 39% of our group chose, and 10%, which was 44% chosen. So I will let Michelle answer that question. Okay, so everybody who guessed 25% was correct. So a quarter of the individuals who are trying to um, do a New Year's resolution are still working on it on January 8th. So that, <laughs> uh, that's not a great percentage. So we're here to remind you of your New Year's resolutions and hope that um, as we get into spring and summer, we're still working on those health and wellness goals, um, especially as beach season comes around. Second poll question to you, what percent of individuals actually achieve their resolutions and again you should get something on your screen so you can guess what percent actually achieve those resolutions so we had zero zero people select 20 percent we had 29 percent of our group select 14 percent and we had 71 percent select eight percent Okay, the majority of you guys are correct. It is 8%. So that's a really sad number. So that's why this topic is really great for right now because, um, it, you know, 8% actually achieve those resolutions. So we want to remind you of some tips to help with your health and wellness New Year's resolutions. Um, it comes at a great time being the first day of Lent. If that's something you practice, that might be a good incentive to get back on the wagon and refocus around whatever goals you made for yourself this year when it comes to your health and wellness. So as Tim was talking about, um, he is going to limit his added sugar intake for Lent. So this first slide is for you, Tim. This is a reminder of how to calculate those added sugars that we're consuming. So added sugars and everything. If you guys were here for our very first nutrition presentation over a year ago, we harped on this a good bit. We talked about the new nutrition label and how great it is because it's now telling us how many grams of added sugar are in the products we're consuming. Sugar is in everything. There are 19 grams of added sugar in one serving of Sweet Baby Ray's barbecue sauce. There's 39 grams of added sugar in one can of Coke. So you can see it adds up very quickly. And as Tim reminded all of us, the World Health Organization recommends a max of 25 grams of added sugar each day. So we want to try and keep our added sugar consumption underneath 25 grams. And I get the question all the time, does fruit, natural sugar from fruit, count towards that 25 grams? And the answer is no. We're only talking about added sugar that's dumped in. But that does include honey or coconut sugar, or molasses. Those are still maple syrup. Those are still added sugars. Okay, natural sugar would be the fructose found in, in fruit that does not count. Okay, so if you are trying to figure out how many grams of sugar are in whatever it is that you're eating, we're going to look at this nutrition facts label. We're going to come down to this line where it says includes nine grams of added sugar. All right, so that's nine grams towards our 25 for the day. All right, so the new nutrition label makes it really easy to count up that those sugar over the course of the day, and we just want to stay underneath 25. I want to point out that we haven't talked much about artificial sweeteners. So artificial sweeteners are made in a factory. They're used in products that say diet or sugar-free. A lot of the time, diet drinks are typically sweetened with aspartame or sucralose. Sucralose is another name for Splenda. There's also saccharin. So if you're consuming products that are sugar-free or diet, I want you to look at the ingredient list and look for those three words. One of those three words typically is what's in there to make the product sweet. And unfortunately, all three of those are toxic to our brain and to our gut. Okay, so we wanna do our very best to avoid all three of those artificial sweeteners. Uh, if you get migraines, if you're still struggling with your weight loss, but you're not consuming much sugar, it might be that artificial sweetener. If you have gut issues, IBS or bloating, gas, constipation, diarrhea, it might be those artificial sweeteners. So be very careful and start to pay attention to that ingredient list. Healthy alternatives that don't spike our blood sugar nor count towards our total sugar intake for the day would be stevia and monk fruit sweetener. So if you're eating something that is diet or sugar-free and it's sweetened with either of those, then we're okay. All right, and again, we'll send out these slides if you guys are, are trying to take some notes or you think you're going to forget these words. We'll send these slides out so you can have a reminder and come back to it. 
All right, number two, when it comes to your, your New Year's resolution, if it was anything around health and wellness, whether that was you want more energy, you want to lose weight, you want to lower your cholesterol, you want to lower your blood pressure, processed oils and avoiding them is a way to do that. It is a must for health longevity we absolutely need to start paying attention to these processed oils they are not talked about enough i think sugar is getting a lot of airtime these days which is amazing and i'm really glad that it is because it is a number one driver in obesity and type 2 diabetes but processed oils are a close second when it comes to overall health and they are most definitely degrading our health Again, if you think back to that very first presentation that we had, every single one of our cells around the outside has what's called a phospholipid bilayer. Lipid is another word for fat. And that phospholipid bilayer controls what goes in our cell and what goes out of our cell. So when we eat healthy fat, we're able to build a healthy phospholipid bilayer. So that cell is functioning correctly, it's letting in what it should, and it's letting out what it should. When we're eating these processed oils, these processed fats, we're building unhealthy phospholipid bilayers. So we're setting ourselves up for disease at a cellular level. When we're consuming things like soybean oil, canola oil, vegetable, corn, peanut, sunflower, safflower oil, they create inflammation in the body and then they build those unhealthy cells. So again, I want you to start getting in the habit of not only checking how many grams of sugar are in the products you're consuming, but checking that ingredient list. We're going to look for those artificial sweeteners, and now we're also going to look for those processed oils. Hey, familiarize yourself with the words soybean oil and canola oil. Those are the most common used in our processed foods. And a, a place that they're hidden, we think of, oh, we're going to make this big, beautiful salad, and then we're going to drown it in ranch dressing. We really just <laughs> decline the health of that salad or, or the amount of nutrients we get from that salad when we do that because that salad dressing, nine times out of ten, is full of soybean oil or canola oil. So Primal Kitchen is a great brand. It's made with avocado oil, all of their salad dressings, and that way we can keep that salad nice and nutrient dense and we're not ruining um, the health of that salad or what it's doing for our body, okay? So healthy oils, olive oil, that's when we wanna keep it room temperature. We've discussed that before, so that's good for making your own homemade salad dressing or dipping your food in. And then if you're gonna cook with it or heat an oil, you want avocado oil, coconut oil, ghee, or which is clarified butter, butter without the milk protein, or carry gold grass fed butter, all great for cooking. If you're baking and you need, um, maybe the recipe calls for vegetable oil, just do avocado oil. It's a one for one substitute. There's no taste difference. All right, again, so if you have a New Year's resolution of trying to lose some weight or maintain a healthy weight or you want more energy throughout the day, we have to start paying attention to how many grams of carbohydrates we're eating on a daily basis. So the typical American actually gets 50 to 60% of their calories every day from carbs. And really that number should be closer to 25 or 30% depending on your body type. This is something I help people do all the time is figure out how many calories per day they need and then where those calories should be coming from. We've been told for a long time that 2,000 calories a day is the magic number, but when we think about a little petite female who's five foot two and a six foot eight male and we tell them, each of them, that they both need 2,000 calories a day, that doesn't make much sense. A, a five foot two female and a six foot eight male certainly have different caloric needs. And so part of my job is helping people, depending on your height, your weight, your activity level, and your goals, and your body composition, what should your calorie intake look like on a daily basis? And then where should those calories come from? What percent from carbs, protein, and fat? So you guys, as a reminder, have me as a resource to reach out to with your wellness questions. And maybe that's one of your wellness questions. And I'd love to help you figure out those numbers. But across the board, no matter what your goals are, no matter how tall you are, what your weight is, what your body composition is, we need to make sure that we're not consuming 50 to 60% of our calories every day from carbohydrates. It should be closer to 25 or 30. Right? And that also typically goes hand in hand with your fat consumption. We're typically not getting enough healthy fat and we're overdoing it on the carbs. So we need to pay attention and maybe flip flop those numbers. And again, I can help you with that on an individual basis if you're interested. All right, number four, we all need to move. So throughout 2020, you should make it a goal 
to get at least, I know that magic number, 10,000 steps a day is a great number, um, but just to move. We got to get up and we got to move. Low levels of physical activity throughout the day is actually amazing. I'm really guilty of this, or I was before I was on maternity leave. I would do my workout. I was a morning workout person, and I do my one-hour workout, and then I would sit at my desk for eight hours, and I thought, okay, well, I checked the box. I got my workout in. I'm good to go, but what we've really figured out is that low-level physical activity throughout the day is a lot better for your metabolism and for your overall health. So maybe that's you set a timer for every hour you get up and you just do a lap around the office or a lap around your house if you're working from home. Um, maybe you do use a standing desk, but any way to get some low-level physical activity throughout the day is going to be really great for you. And also, if you're a cardio lover, I really encourage you this year to try and get some strength training in. Strength training is really important, especially as we get older, for bone density and for preventing falls. Falls are really dangerous, especially as we get 70, 80 years old. They can really decline our health rapidly. Also, we'll talk more about blood sugar when we get to the diabetes portion of this presentation, but blood sugar stability is incredibly important for preventing diabetes, for managing your diabetes, and for living a long time. Well, I'll talk about the blood sugar graph in a few slides and remind you that longevity is linked to blood sugar stability. And one way to do that is every time we eat a meal, we go for a 10 to 30 minute walk. So that reduces the impact that that meal has on your blood sugar. So maybe you have a high carbohydrate meal and it's gonna spike your blood sugar to 200 if you just go right back to your desk and sit back down after that meal. But if you go for a 10 to 30 minute walk, your blood sugar spike would, would be considerably less. So maybe it only spikes your blood sugar to 150 instead of that 200. So I really encourage you to get out there and move more this year. Go get a, you use the health tracker on your phone, go get want something, wear it on your wrist, try and get those steps in. That's a great way to just um, encourage you to get some low-level physical activity in throughout the day. Number five is fiber. Okay, so for those of you are, who are unfamiliar with fiber, fiber is in a lot of fruits and vegetables, and it helps with our digestive system. It helps break down food, helps keep us regular, helps prevent tons of bloating, gas, constipation, diarrhea, and it actually breaks down into short-chain fatty acids that inhibit the conversion of glucose into fatty acids. So that's a really scientific, sciencey thing to say that it increases our insulin sensitivity, which essentially helps us prevent diabetes. Okay, so we want to keep our body nice and sensitive to insulin. Insulin is what the pancreas releases when we have a high sugar meal and we need to get our blood sugar down. So we eat, um, maybe we have a donut for breakfast, the pancreas releases insulin, insulin goes, gets that sugar, pulls it out of the blood and brings our blood sugar back down to normal. If the insulin isn't able to go do its job, then we walk around with high blood sugar and that can be really, really dangerous for our health. So we want to make sure we maintain insulin sensitivity. So throughout the day, make sure you're consuming at least one serving of one of these foods every single day. So Brussels sprouts, artichokes, broccoli, pears, avocado, blackberries, raspberries, oats, almonds, quinoa. I'm not saying one serving of each, but every day maybe you have a serving of Brussels sprouts. Maybe that's today. Maybe tomorrow you're going to have a serving of broccoli. The next day it's going to be half an avocado. So again, we'll share these slides so that you're familiar with these foods that are high in fiber so that you can make sure you're getting one serving each day. All right, number six. This one's a little bit outside of the box. This is new to the health and wellness world. Well, not that new, but um, recently come back up in the media about cold thermogenesis. So for those of you that don't know what that is, that's essentially cold immersion. So we're getting in a cold shower, an ice bath cryotherapy, which is one of those tubes that um, gets down to like negative 175 or 200 degrees and you only stay in there for three minutes. But cold therapy is really good for our body. Uh, adiponectin is a hormone that's released when we are exposed to that much cold and it breaks down fat and shuttles glucose into our muscles. Okay, so it helps with weight loss, it helps with blood sugar regulation, it reduces food cravings, enhances your immune system, and then improves thyroid function. So we have a lot of, of people suffering with thyroid issues. I really recommend this, whether it's a cold shower, and you can do contrast, so you can do one minute as cold as you can make that shower, and then one minute back to hot, and you can do that maybe 10 times. Or if you're really, really brave and you want to go to the gas station and buy a 10-pound bag of ice and sit in a, an ice bath for 10 minutes, you can do that. If you do have access to a cold tub, 
you can hop in there, try and last. Maybe you just start with one minute and you work your way up to 10 minutes. Or if you do have access to a cryotherapy tube, try that out. They're, they're popping up all over the place and they're really beneficial. If you are a athlete and you're training for a marathon or if you do CrossFit or any sort of high level activity where you're sore, cold thermogenesis can help significantly with that lactic acid buildup and help reduce your soreness. All right, lastly, before we get into the diabetes piece, I wanna remind you that 80% of our calories should be coming from whole real food. Again, no matter what your health and wellness New Year's resolution was, eating whole real food is gonna help get you there. Okay, so this is fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, eggs, beans, oats, all of those are whole real foods. We follow that 80-20 rule. So 20% of the time we eat the pizza, drink the beer, have whatever it is that is our vice, and 80% of the time we're consuming that whole real food. And if you break that down into meals per week, so say we eat three meals a day, seven days a week, that's four meals per week that we get to have whatever we want. Okay, so maybe that's we want to eat pizza four times a week, but that means you're not having any booze and you're not having any dessert. You're just going to use your 20% on pizza. The rest of the time you're on track, you're eating that whole real food. Or maybe you want to have four drinks per week and that's your 20%. Maybe you want to have dessert four times a week and that becomes your 20%. But we can't have four drinks per week, four desserts per week, and pizza four times per week. Okay, that's not how it works. All right, so 80% of the time we're eating that whole real food, 20% of the time we're living it up. All right, let's jump into diabetes prevention and management. This is, I know this is kind of um, a shift, but they do overlap. Some of the things I just talked about are gonna go right into this diabetes prevention and management. This is a really important thing that we all need to pay attention to because diabetes is skyrocketing in our society these days, and it's very, very preventable. All right, it's a very costly disease. Um, it's a very dangerous disease. And for a long time, we actually thought that it was genetic. And so if your mom and your grandma had diabetes, you were doomed to have diabetes. And what we figured out is that's not true at all. Epigenetics, which Duke right here in North Carolina has been studying for two decades, has figured out that just because you might have the gene for diabetes doesn't mean that you are going to develop type 2 diabetes. If you continue to eat properly and exercise, you can keep that gene turned off your whole life. So think about it like a light switch. That's the gene in your body, you have that light switch, and if you don't exercise and you eat too much sugar, that, that light switch is gonna get turned on, and there you go, you have type two diabetes. But if you follow what we're gonna talk about here, you take good care of yourself, you can go your whole life with that light switch turned on and never get that type two diabetes diagnosis. All right, so a couple stats around diabetes. We've got 37.3 million Americans actually have the diabetes diagnosis, which is about 11%. And we've got 96 million Americans have pre-diabetes. So they haven't been officially given the diabetes diagnosis and aren't on medication, but they are teetering right on that line. And the, the really exciting thing is that type two diabetes is absolutely preventable. I know that I said that a moment ago, but I wanna reiterate that because it is preventable, whether it's in your genes or not, it is absolutely preventable. And we're gonna talk about how we can do that today. All right, so real quick, let's talk about the difference between type one and type two. Type one diabetes is much, much, much more rare. It's actually an autoimmune disease. This is not preventable. Um, there are a few people that will argue that it is because it's an autoimmune disease and we can, uh, we're starting to figure out how to treat those autoimmune diseases. Uh, the jury's out for me on that. You can do your own research if you have type one diabetes um, or know someone that does, I'd be happy to guide them to some people who are, who are starting to think about that as something that's preventable or treatable, excuse me. Um, but often it begins in childhood and can be genetic or faulty beta cells. And the treatment is in insulin injections. Okay, so your body doesn't produce insulin at all. So we have to take exogenous insulin to help get the sugar out of the blood. A little bit sciencey, but today we're gonna to mostly focus on type two diabetes, so I'm gonna keep going. So type two diabetes, the one that's absolutely present preventable, is where you constantly are consuming sugar and processed carbs that break down like sugar to where that insulin isn't doing its job anymore. Again, insulin is released from the pancreas to go get the sugar and pull it out of your blood. But if we release that insulin and it can't go get the sugar and pull it out of your blood, you are constantly walking around with a high blood sugar. 
Okay. And that's really dangerous. Originally, we actually, we didn't call this type two diabetes. We called it adult onset diabetes, but unfortunately now we're seeing this in children. Our children have probably the worst diet that we've ever had in history. Think about all the kid foods out there. They're packed full of sugar, packed full of dye. They're very addictive. Uh, and we start feeding to our them to our kids at a very, very young age, and then they become addictive, and it's very hard to change those eating habits. Okay, so now we've changed the name to type 2 diabetes because we have so many kids with this diagnosis. The treatment includes medication to help regulate the blood sugar levels and lifestyle. They recommend lifestyle changes. It can be completely treated with lifestyle changes, but you have to be very, very aggressive in those changes, and we'll talk about those today. All right, real quick, the role of insulin. So I wanna walk you through what happens in someone with type one diabetes and someone with type two diabetes when they eat something like a candy cane or a lollipop or a donut. So if you have type one diabetes, you eat a donut, your blood sugar rises, and then there is no insulin to come and get the blood sugar down. All right, so that person has to inject insulin that will go grab the blood sugar and bring their blood sugar back down to a normal level. If you have type 2 diabetes, your blood sugar rises, you produce that insulin, but it might not be enough or your body doesn't recognize it because it's produced so much over time that you don't have insulin sensitivity anymore. You actually have what's called insulin resistance. Okay, so your blood sugar then remains high and you have to take a medication to reduce that blood sugar. Something like a metformin, you might be familiar with that drug. So that's the difference between type 1 and type 2. There are many, many complications of type 1 and type 2 diabetes. One of my very best friends is a foot and ankle surgeon, and she spends her days, unfortunately, amputating the toes, feet, and legs of people with diabetes. And she has sent me many pictures over the years, and I honestly thought about putting some of those pictures in here, but they're, they're so gnarly. I, I don't know that I could do it. Um, obviously, we've respected HIPAA, and I have no idea who those people are, but she does use them to do education around diabetes and what can happen because it is really scary, and we all need to take this seriously. But what happens with diabetic neuropathy, so that's that second one down, down here underneath both type 1 and type 2, essentially, we don't have any pain, um, pain receptors, and we get numbness in our extremities. And so we might do something like step on a, a piece of glass in our foot. We get a cut in our foot, but we don't feel it. And then we keep going and doing our lives on it. It becomes infected. And then that's how we end up with needing that amputation. So that's a really serious one. We get that ni diabetic neuropathy in our eyes. So we can have eye damage. We can get hearing impairment, heart disease, kidney damage kidney disease, that's one you absolutely want to avoid. So the, the complication of diabetes are very serious. And again, with that type two diabetes, all can be prevented with some lifestyle choices. So managing diabetes, we, we're gonna, I'm gonna focus on that type two diabetes guys, so I wanna make sure we have uh, time for questions at the end. But some things, if you've already been given that type two diabetes diagnosis, I really encourage you to make sure you're monitoring your blood sugar regularly. We want to keep it within the range that your doctor is recommending. Every time we go outside of that range, we're taking time off our life. We really, really, really want to take that seriously um, and, and work on your nutrition to avoid those huge spikes. And again, I would love to work with you if you have that diagnosis or maybe you've been diagnosed with pre-diabetes and you want to make sure that doesn't convert over. Please reach out to me. You guys have me as a free resource through your amazing financial advisors, and I would really love to work with you. Having a regular exercise routine helps regulate that blood sugar. We talked about that in a, a few slides ago, but when we're exercising regularly, when we're doing that strength training, that helps keep our blood sugar more normal and more stable. And then those processed foods full of sugar are, are need to be avoided. Okay? And those are the ones that create that huge spike in our blood sugar, and we want to avoid that at all costs. The paleo diet or the Whole30 are really great ones to research. If you're bordering type 2 diabetes or have been given that diagnosis, those are amazing because they don't allow you to have any added sugar. And then the carbohydrates that you do have are very complex and, and really do a great job not spiking the blood sugar. Okay, if you want help, again, navigating either one of those, please reach out. I'd love to help you. All right, so if you have diabetes in your family or you maybe have, again, been given that pre-diabetes diagnosis, here are some things that we absolutely need to start implementing into our life. 
All right, so we got to be really strict about that 80-20 rule. 80% of the time we're eating those whole real foods. 20% of the time we can reach for that something sugary, but we got to be, I think it shouldn't be the 50-50 rule or the 60-40 rule. We want to make sure it's the 80-20. Think about how often you eat out. For the first time in history, we're actually spending more money in restaurants than we are in grocery stores. We really need to reverse that because when we're eating meals made in our own kitchen, we have much more control over what's going into those meals. I don't think we realize quite uh, how much sugar restaurants are cooking with, even if it's something that we don't think might have sugar in it. A lot of times it does, whether it's a sauce, a condiment. Um, we we're, like we really need to think about making more meals in our kitchen because then we can control whether there's sugar in there or not. Also, a lot of times when we go to restaurants, they're cooking with those soybean oil and canola oil, those really inflammatory, cheap oils. Exercise three or more times per week. I can't emphasize this enough. Go get a wearable. Encourage yourself to get those 10,000 steps every day. Maybe you join a gym. Maybe you have a walking club, some people to keep you accountable. That exercise is really important. Count the amount of added sugar you consume. Sleep. This is a really important one. So what it's... Um, the, what's been proven, and Dr. Matthew Walker does an amazing job about this, and I think some of you have had the privilege to speak with him, but he talks about how our bodies are more insulin uh, sensitive when we get better sleep. So we have a higher chance of developing type 2 diabetes when we don't sleep enough. So if you're sleeping less than seven hours per night, your chance of developing type 2 diabetes is greater. I really encourage you to get seven to eight hours at least per night, and they should be the same seven to eight hours every night. So maybe it's 10 to six, maybe it's nine to five, um, but we really, and also your body best recovers and gets the best quality sleep between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. So I encourage you to be asleep if you can by 10 p.m. every night and make sure you're maximizing the amount of time you're asleep between that 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. Water. Water is really important. I've written about this a few times in your weekly newsletter, but that's just because it's that important. We want half your body weight in ounces of water every day. So if we weigh 150 pounds, that's 75 ounces of water every day. And Chris asked me before we started, is seltzer water okay? And I asked him a couple follow-up questions. How's your bone density? Because seltzer water sometimes has a tendency to pull a little bit of calcium out of your bones. So if you have osteoporosis or poor bone density, or that runs in your family, try not to consume too many of those ounces from seltzer water, just go for good old fashioned water. But if you don't have either trouble with either one of those, then seltzer water could be an okay option. Just make sure there's no added sugar or artificial sweetener in there. And then we want tons of plants. We're getting lots of fiber with those plants. The plants don't have any added sugar in them. And we want a variety of plants. I think I talked about this when we talked about gut health, but there's a huge project going on right now, a big study on gut health, because we're figuring out how important our gut health is and how it's linked to so many other ailments. And they're looking at the guts of 40,000 individuals across the world. And they've put some parameters around defining the healthiest guts, but the people with the healthiest guts have one thing in common, and is they consume on average 30 different types of plants per week. Okay, so that seems really overwhelming for me when I heard that because I can't, I don't think I can name 30 types of vegetables, but plants are defined as fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, and herbs. So if you think about, we love to make spaghetti squash spaghetti. So it's just regular spaghetti, but instead of using the, the regular noodles, we use spaghetti squash. So in that one dish alone, you're getting the spaghetti squash, onions, garlic, oregano, basil, tomato, thyme. So that's seven of your plants for the week in one meal. So it's a lot less daunting when you realize how much is included in that. But I encourage you, maybe you make that a goal over the next two weeks to try to get 30 different types of plants per week. All right, a couple sneaky foods you might not realize are gonna raise your blood sugar, gonna create that spike in your blood sugar that we're trying to avoid for longevity purposes, for uh, diabetes prevention and diabetes management. Flavored coffee creamers. If you guys are using the, I can't, uh, instant something something or 
um, what is it, Delight, something Delight, those coffee creamers a lot of times have a ton of sugar in them. Or if you go to Starbucks and you get some sort of Frappuccino, even if you get the sugar-free kind, they're using one of those artificial sweeteners that we're trying to avoid. So a couple coffee creamers that I recommend, the So Delicious brand has a sugar-free coffee creamer that's amazing. I really like the Nut Pods. They have all different flavors. Those are great. Uh, watch out for that instant oatmeal. So oats are a great source of complex carbs, but not the brown sugar Quaker instant oats. Okay, and those have a ton of sugar. We want to buy the whole rolled oats. You can add whatever you want, whatever liquid you want to turn it into oatmeal and then doctor it up yourself. Maybe you add a little bit of stevia or monk fruit sweetener. Maybe you add peanut butter. Maybe you add dried fruit. Okay, but make it yourself versus the instant white and wheat bread and white and wheat pasta we've talked about these before but they break down in your body just like sugar even the wheat stuff the exceptions to that would be the ezekiel bread dave's killer bread would be second best and then for pasta we want to reach for something like a brown rice pasta or a quinoa pasta white rice i would say this isn't 100 percent of people get the spike from white rice but the majority of folks do so be careful. If you want to find out if you are one of those people that gets the spike from white rice, you can either test your blood sugar. You can buy a little $30 kit on Amazon where you can prick your finger about an hour after you eat that white rice and see what your blood sugar is. That's a really, I think it's a fascinating experiment. Or just see how you feel. If about an hour after you eat that white rice, you want to take a nap, then it created a big spike in your blood sugar and you're experiencing that crash that follows the spike organic snacks. So just because it's organic does not mean it's sugar free. A lot of times they trick you. They say it's organic, super healthy. But if you look at the amount of added sugar in there, it might be anywhere from 10 to 25 grams per serving. So just pay attention. Dried cranberries. The cranberries that I looked at in the store the other day had 27 grams of added sugar per serving. If you think dried fruit, I'm going to put a few on my salad and then your salad goes from something super healthy and nutritious to a dessert. So be careful. Dairy, dairy products without any added sugar, like a yogurt without any added sugar can be pretty gross. And so the dairy companies know that. So they'll dump in added sugar to make the yogurt taste better. So be careful there. And then bananas. I know there's no added sugar in a banana, but when we take the peel off the banana, we're stripping the banana of that fiber. So the fiber is the part that slows the breakdown of the sugar so it doesn't create that spike but we obviously don't eat the peel of the banana. Maybe you do, you're weird. But if, if you're like most people and you don't, then you're removing that fiber. And so that banana is gonna break down more like sugar in the body instead of breaking down slowly over time and giving you that long lasting energy. Now, if you're going out to run a 5K or run a half marathon or do a heavy workout, a banana is a great choice. Reach for that banana, it's gonna give you quick energy. But if you're trying to lose weight or have consistent energy throughout the day, a banana isn't the way to go. Oh my goodness. Okay. So this is a picture of obviously a Rockstar Coke and a Gatorade and how much sugar is in each of those. All right. So you can see the amount of sugar in one Rockstar, one 20 ounce Coke and one 20 ounce Gatorade. And this tube right here in the front of that picture is the amount of sugar you're supposed to have for one day. So that, that front tube, that's 25 grams of sugar. And then you can see how much sugar is in each of those drinks. So it's not just our snacks, it's not just the food that's creating these, uh, this chaos in our, in our society with pre-diabetes and type 2 diabetes, but our drinks are a major contributor as well. So if you're an energy drink consumer, be very careful with how much added sugar is in there. And if there's zero grams of added sugar, nine and a half times out of 10, there's an artificial sweetener in there instead. So be careful again, look for those words, aspartame, sucralose, and saccharin. They're going to create uh, that disruption in the gut and the brain. Coke, the Coke is, I've seen the commercial everywhere, new Coke Zero. It's not sweetened with stevia or monk fruit sweetener. It's with an artificial sweetener. So don't think that they've redone their formula to make it nice and healthy for you. It's not. Zevia is a good soda alternative. There's no dye in it, and it's sweetened with stevia. And they have all the different regular soda flavors. Okay, and again, that's called Zevia. And then Gatorade, this is something that we, we commonly give to our kids, our little kids playing sports. We think, oh, they got to have a Gatorade. Gatorade is packed full of sugar and packed full of dye. Our kids do not need Gatorade. 
right? They need water. And if you're really, really, really pushing them hard and they're out there for hours on end in the hot sunshine, you can add an electrolyte powder like Ultima or a noon tablet to their water to help give them the additional electrolytes. But please don't give your kids a 20 ounce Gatorade. All right, as a reminder, we've seen this graph before, maybe about a year ago. This is what's going on when we give our kids something like a Gatorade. Look at that red line. So you gave little Johnny a Gatorade and his blood sugar goes straight up. And then after it goes straight up, it comes straight down. Okay, and where it says 240 minutes after starting eating, that's a blood sugar crash. We wanna take a nap, we crave more sugar, we crave carbohydrates, we're cranky. And so maybe we've reached for another soda, maybe we reach for a carby snack and we send our blood sugar straight up again. And every time we do this, we take a little bit of time off our life because that's what the latest research on longevity is showing us. Every time we spike our blood sugar, our life gets a little bit shorter because the, the fewer times in our life we create that spike, the longer we live. So we want our blood sugar to stay nice and even, this green line right here. This is what we're going for, for the majority of the time in our life, right? So avoiding those foods that we talked about, doing more exercise, making sure we get good sleep, eating lots of fiber, that's gonna keep our blood sugar nice and stable with that green line. I can talk about that all day long, but I'm gonna keep going because I wanna make sure you have time for questions. All right, we talked about this on that very first slide. The one thing that I didn't mention on the first slide is this percent daily value column. So again, the new nutrition label is very exciting for the fact that it tells you how many grams of added sugar are in that product. Okay, so if you're trying to prevent diabetes, if you know you have diabetes in your family, if you've been given that diagnosis, this is something you absolutely need to do. You need to count how many grams of added sugar you're consuming on a daily basis. But I want you to ignore this number. And the reason that is, is because for all my math wizards on the call, we know that 10 grams is not 20% of 25. The FDA through this nutrition label is trying to tell you that whatever this product is, it's 20% of your total recommended amount of sugar for the day. And why that they made that number 20 is because when we look back 30 years ago to the first nutrition facts label, there's no percent daily value across from sugar. And that's because the sugar lobbyists, they came in, they said, no, 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 we can't have people knowing that a Coca-Cola is nearly 175% of your sugar for the entire day. That would be really bad for the sugar business. So they paid somebody to have that number removed. Fast forward 30 years, we had this number, they lost the battle. We now have to have a percent daily value next to sugar, but instead of using the World Health Organization's recommended 25 grams per day, they're telling the American population that they can have 50 grams of sugar per day and that's a healthy amount. And it's not a healthy amount. We should not be consuming 50 grams of added sugar every day. So now that you're an informed consumer, you know you can ignore this number, go with this, 10 grams, that's 10 of my 25. Spend it however you want, but we only get 25 per day, especially when it comes to diabetes prevention and management and longevity. All right, so I wanna show you before we wrap up how quickly the amount of sugar that we're consuming adds up. So this is like a typical American diet. Maybe this is like what I had when I was a kid. So what a lot of kids are eating in our country today. They might have cereal with orange juice for breakfast, so before they walk out the door to go to school, they've had 8.5 teaspoons. All right, so I will tell you that the World Health Organization, that 25 grams is the equivalent of six teaspoons. So we want six teaspoons of sugar max per day. So before I've left for school, I've had more than my daily allotment. I go to lunch, I have peanut butter and jelly sandwich with bread, that's 8.25 more teaspoons. For a snack, I have a Nutella and Go, 5.75 teaspoons, and then dinner, I have salad dressing and pasta with sauce, three teaspoons. So that's not even a lot of food. I didn't put a soda in there, not a Gatorade. Um, for lunch, the only thing we had was a sandwich, no sides to my lunch, and no juice, oh no, orange juice for breakfast, sorry. And we get 25.5 teaspoons or 102 grams of sugar. That's how quickly that sugar adds up. So let's go to a day that would give us very minimal sugar with a lot more food. So here's an example day of what we should try to be striving for as a country, as a whole, for overall health, diabetes prevention and management, heart disease prevention and management, high blood pressure reduction. This is an amazing day. So we get three eggs, one apple, and two cups of coffee with a raw sugar in each for breakfast. Okay, the only sugar is coming from that raw sugar in your coffee. 
For snack, we're gonna have carrots and hummus. Lunch, we're gonna have turkey roll-ups with cheese, lettuce, and grapes. Snack, we're gonna have raw almonds and beef jerky, a little bit of sugar in that beef jerky marinade. And then for dinner, we're gonna have grilled chicken, sweet potato, and asparagus. And over the course of that whole day, we're only getting 15 grams of sugar total, added sugar total. And again, so if you are a six foot eight male or a five foot two female, we can change these numbers up and it's not gonna change the sugar much. So if you're a six foot eight male and you need to eat seven eggs for breakfast, you're still only having 2.5 teaspoons because it came from the sugar in your coffee. If you're a six foot eight male and you need to eat a whole bag of carrots and a whole container of hummus, that's still gonna be zero teaspoons of sugar. And so take a picture of this or come back to the slide once we send these out and use this as an example day to help you with your overall health moving forward. All right, that's it. Questions, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and let you guys submit your questions. Thanks, Michelle. All right, um, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of Zoom if you wanna ask your questions. Guess I'm not going to McDonald's for lunch now. No, nope. no. Nope. Nope. You know, no, just kidding. All right, no questions yet. I'll right, give everybody a couple of minutes. Chris or Tim, you guys have any questions you can think of or from your clients or just personally? Start a good one. I had a client who actually was uh, just talking to me about their New Year's resolutions. And she said, you know, Chris, my New Year's resolution is to lose 10 pounds. I said, oh, that's awesome. That's back to this. She said, they've only got 15 to go. <laughs> so I appreciate that one. She shared that with me and that's going to be a forever. Um, one, I think another client said, if you have trouble losing weight, try gaining weight as your new year's resolution. Oh. <laughs> so, I mean, that's an opposite way to look at it. No, that's not, not productive. I did have one for psychology. Uh, yeah, exactly. Chris, but, Chris uh, offers a different approach than Michelle for those of you. You can hire Chris. Yeah, it was just the yeah. opposite approach, Michelle. I thought maybe that would be, that would be helpful. Yeah. Um, and then maybe this is for somebody else, but if you're afraid of gaining weight, take a shot of whiskey before you eat because that'll reduce your fear. Wow. So those, uh, those were three I heard from clients over time. I thought they were quite funny. But they, oh. My clients tend to come in, I tell jokes and they come in and say that. So for some of you, that might be, uh, that might be the way. So one question I have for Michelle is with the Theragun, so you're talking about muscle and, and, and how muscle responds. Do Theraguns have any benefit to uh, circulation or, or are they finding uh, muscle activity in the body? Theragun is amazing to reduce uh, soreness or mm -hmm. if you get trigger points like in your traps from, you know, we're all like this, we drive, we eat, we sit, we're, you know, we got to work on pulling our shoulders back. So a lot of us like get real knotty up here, which can create pain in our shoulders. So hit that, those knots with a Theragun, that's a great way to help prevent shoulder injury or just like maybe tension headaches, something like that. Absolutely. Um, another thing that I would recommend with the Theragun is your IT band. So your yeah. IT band, that's your iliotibial band. It runs from your hip down to the side of your knee. So if you have a seam on the side of your pants, that's essentially where your IT band is on the outside of your pants. Um, it's not a muscle. It's not a tendon. It's not a ligament. You can't stretch it. There will be people that try and tell you you can stretch it. You can't. It's just a band of fascia. And if that gets really tight, you'll get hip, low back, and knee pain or one of those. And so that Theragun or a foam roller is a great way to get the knots out in that IT band. Again, if we sit too long or if we exercise and then we sit and we don't stretch, um, that IT band is going to get real knotted up. So hit that that IT band with a the Theragun. Yep. Chris, I love, I love the Theragun. I, have, I got one for the house and then we got one for our employee wellness room. I mean, I, I use it once or twice a day for even three or four minutes just to between meetings, it's great. Would that work on Achilles as well? <clears throat> if somebody has Achilles tightness, would it work on areas that don't have a lot of blood flow like an Achilles or something? Uh, do your calf. Mm -hmm. Don't, I wouldn't like hit the Achilles tendon with a Theragun, but just come mm -hmm. up and do yeah. both your gastroc and soleus, your two calf muscles with the Theragun. Sure. Yeah. Uh, quick question popped up. Uh, does the total amount of sugar shown on a food label include whatever would be converted from eating carbs? My guess to that would be no, but Michelle, you would know. So the total sugar is what's added plus any natural sugar from fructose or lactose. So like dairy products, if you look at a dairy product with no added sugar, it would still have some total sugar in it because there's natural sugar in dairy called lactose. Okay, maybe there is, maybe you're eating something with dried fruit in it and there's no added sugar. You might have total sugar five grams and that's from the sugar in the dried fruit. 
Okay, so it doesn't have to do with carbs. It just has to do with natural sugar so, plus so added. All we're really focused on is added sugar. When we look at a label and it says eight you know, grams of sugar, but zero added, that's, that's zero, right? Or does that count as eight of our 25? Nope, that does not count as eight of your 25. Okay, just the added. Just the added, yep. Okay. An extension of that question was how much time would it take for, for a reduction of sugar intake? intake to show up on a blood test. So if you started lowering your sugar intake, would that, you know, quickly result in your next lab workup? Yeah, it really depends on how aggressive you are with it um, and where you're starting. So it could be anywhere like as short as six, six weeks and three months is typically when we retest. So I do nutrition coaching for a functional medicine practice. I think I've talked to you guys about that. We typically do three months, like really focus on this for three months and then we'll retest and we'll see a significant reduction if they've been really working on it. Michelle, there was a, a group as well, Dr. Navarrete, um, uh, who I work with from a, a group called the Bummer360, but he had a 25 day, and he's done this for quite a bit, a 25 day no sugar challenge. Mm -hmm. Pretty interesting when you look at that, but it may be something wanna, some people in the group want to try. It's very difficult at first, but you'll find over time the results and how people feel 25 days after really attempt. I mean, 25 is right, but, and I know you're talking about 80%, but if people really want to take a deep dive, then no sugar, it's very difficult. But it's also can be for those who do it very, very restorative. Is that have you heard of this? Yes. Yeah. And that's essentially what the whole 30 is. They do no added sugar at all. I don't know if you're familiar with that one, but very similar concept. No processed foods on that. Um, but I, I yeah, and I've done it. I've done it myself. I did six weeks of no added sugar at all. You feel so good your brain just is so quick it's amazing the reduction in inflammation in the brain and how quick things come to you you just feel sharp you sleep really well you have great energy i would definitely recommend it to anybody chris you might get too smart if you did that so you might not want to do that. <laughs> no um, i did that. i did whole i did whole 13 one time i made it 13 right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, did, I didn't get to the part i wasn't quite to where i got smarter i think it was on the day 14 when uh, i did make it 13 days this I just thought about this. If we ever have a group that wants to do something like that together, like hey, we all want to commit to this, that would be I cool. would love to to lead yeah. something like that. People can opt in. We can do accountability things. We can do like a little weekly check in, something mm -hmm. like that. I'd love to to lead that. That is so a great idea. Where yeah. Chris and Tim, let's well. let's get together offline on that. I think we could yeah. uh, offer that yeah. to comments and create a great one. Yeah, especially during the Lenten season where we have to give up something anyway. Might be a good idea. Yeah, yeah. great. Let's do it. Yeah, outstanding. I think there was something I just read too about a recent study that said that women who carry a little, <clears throat> women who carry a little bit extra weight live longer than the men who mention it. <laughs> I don't know if that was true or not. Did you, did you that's, that? that's true. That, that is that's true. factual, hundred percent. It could be. It could be either way. That was a study that came out. Let me jump in. Let me jump in before Chris gets further down his list. Um, <laughs> the. Uh, the thing that jumped into my mind too, uh, Michelle, when you were showing the the blood sugar curve, mm -hmm. that's very timely. Is it this the the theory could be flatten the curve? <laughs> flatten the curve, yes. Right? Does it I sound familiar? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Too familiar. And I, I did I did get a question, a text question, um, about bubbler drinks, healthy or no? I don't know what bubbler drinks are, but um bubbly probably very... yeah yeah they're they're fine about so those are those seltzer waters that we talked about briefly okay so if you have osteoporosis in your in your family or have been do your doctors talk to you about that or low bone density or don't do any strength training i wouldn't drink too many of them every day because they can tend to pull calcium out of your bones which can yeah. weaken your bones but if you don't have any of that then yeah it's fine okay cool yeah great i think it's almost 11. I don't see any more questions. Um, thanks, Michelle. That was awesome. We'll have a replay available probably in the next week or so that we can email out to everybody, um, whether you're on it or not. So we'll do that. And then if you want access or have direct questions for Michelle, just reach out to Tim, Chris, or myself, and we'll be happy to connect you with her. That's part of our value add to clients, um, kind of concierge service. So we're happy to do that. Awesome. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Michelle. We totally appreciate it and appreciate yeah. listening to the dad jokes, which I which I tend to be a yeah. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much as well. Bye. Bye. Bye everybody. Thank you guys. Everybody, thank Bye. you guys. We'll talk to you soon. Bye.